All right, so an ounce of salt per day has a great follow-up question and comment. So let me read his comment here and then I'll address it. He says, you have stated that when Jesus Christ returns that it is the end of the world. Revelation states that Christ returns in the clouds and destroys the kingdoms, the angels imprison Satan, and the people reign with Christ for a thousand years. After the thousand years, Satan is loosed again for a season. A season is a quarter of a year, and a year is a thousand years years to deceive the nations once more. The battle of Gog and Magog takes place when and it is then when the heavenly Jerusalem descends. Does this sequence match your thinking? And alright so first of all thanks for this uh, so uh, hopefully we can clear this up a little bit so I believe it's what Ezekiel 30a that talks about Gog and Magog and then also in Revelation 20 so damn dogs um let's go to Ezekiel here right here I think it is 38, 30, I'm not going to read it for you, but um, it basically what happens here in Revelation 20 is the judgment of God, and we read um, the, a parallel passage in Ezekiel 38 about the judgment of God. All right, now. Um, let's go back here. So I, I guess I have to break this into two parts. First of all, <clears throat> I say that Jesus Christ returns at the end of the world. All right, and this is consistent all throughout the Bible. But just to give you one example here, Matthew 24, Jesus is asked, "What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world?" And of course at the end of the world is when he appears in the clouds of heaven and his angels gather together his elect. It's the end of the world. Now, uh, the scenario that salt per day, an ounce of salt per day, um, says has in this uh, statement here, Revelation states that Christ returns in the clouds of heaven right and destroys the kingdoms of the earth right the angels imprison Satan okay and the people reign with Christ for a thousand years wrong right there that's not right because we're not putting our hope into a thousand years uh, Jesus says whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die it doesn't he doesn't say anything about living a thousand years you get a bonus thousand years of your life <clears throat> you know like what was that the pac-man game if you did really good you get you get an extra bonus guy right or ping pinball you know if you you do something you, you get to a certain score you you get a bonus ball well this thousand years there, there is no bonus ball thousand years <clears throat> right I, I don't know uh, you know I, I, look I get it this is what people teach yeah, I mean ev everywhere it's unbelievable it's just not what the Bible teaches okay so uh, I can't let's see let's go to John 11 I guess I mean, I can't show you verse that says, oh, you're going to get a bonus thousand years. Uh, 
Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Well, now you're left with a conundrum. Are you going to believe that you're, you never die? Or are you going to believe you only live a thousand years? Alright? I mean, that's really your choices. You can't have both. Because a thousand years is not eternal life. And what's the point? It doesn't make any sense. So the only thing that you can come up with is, well, it's the end of the world, but it's not really the end of the world. Right? I mean, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, is it the end of the world or not? Or you get a bonus thousand years. Here, it's a bonus thousand years. You guys got high score, so you get a bonus ball. How else do you how else do you really explain this? You see what I'm saying? There's no mention at all in the Bible anywhere of a bonus thousand years where people will be getting another opportunity to be saved. You can't argue that. And if you have a thousand year period where it's just absolute sinless peace and love and no sin well that's not supported by the Bible at all and then you got a big problem here because at the end of the thousand years Satan is loosed and he gathers together his people and it's there's a clear difference between his people and the people of God A clear difference you can't reconcile that so you have at the end of the thousand years you have Satan gathering together his people and they are surrounding the people of God you can't have one you can't have a thousand years of no sin with you know saved people and unsaved people because you can't be unsaved and sinless it's not possible it's not possible at all there's a clear distinction between saved people and unsaved people you can go to rev um, go to Matthew 10 or Matthew 13 or whatever it is and Jesus I mean, time and time again he makes this real simple he talks about the harvest right and the wheat and the tares and the harvest is the end of the world the harvest is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's the end of the world at the harvest is when he gathers his people into his barn that's when we're lifted up in the air and then our enemy which is the terrors the unsaved people are gathered into bundles and burned <clears throat> and we read this this is what happens at the end of the thousand years if you just only knew these two chapters in the Bible Matthew 13 and Revelation 20 it would be very simple for you to see I think if that's all you knew if you were on an island all by yourself and you had two chapters of the Bible Matthew 13 Revelation 20 you'd see it real clearly and you, didn't, you know the main thing you wouldn't have somebody whispering in, in your ear all these all this other stuff so in Revelation 20 we see that fire comes down from God and devours them 
which is Satan and his people. Obviously, God is not sending fire down on the saints, right? Now we can deduce that the saints are up in the air with Jesus when Jesus returns. First the dead in Christ, then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This happens at the end of the world. So also, I mean, you see the scenario here, right? You've got the tares are gathered, and then you've got the wheat are gathered. Now the wheat are in heaven, and the tares are on earth. And I've showed this over and over in Genesis 3, verse 15. God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Jesus is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all wickedness forever and ever. We're putting our hope into eternal life, not not a thousand years all right and so <clears throat> you've got uh, you know this thing here a season is a quarter of a year and a year is a thousand years uh, this that sort of stuff is not um, supported with the, the scripture here in Revelation 20 uh, it's not consistent with anything at all I, I don't know where you're getting that from if somebody taught you that and you believed it I don't know um, I, I can't help you there I, I know what people like to confuse well day means a year a year means a thousand years but you know you could say a thousand years means a day and, and a day means a thousand years and an hour means 15 minutes and 25 seconds equals three years and you know all this stuff it's like your people purposely try to confuse themselves really in 2nd Peter 3 verse 8 it says but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now slow down and think about this. Okay? Because this is not talking about you. you know, one day with you is one day. Fifteen seconds with you, it's fifteen seconds. You know, you go three hours for you, it's three hours for you. But with the Lord, it's much different. He can see a moment in time as though it were a thousand years. He can see a thousand years as though it's just a moment in time. You can't do that. I can't do that. And so why would the why would God apply that to any verse? you know regarding a prophecy in time prophecy or any teaching at all he wouldn't God is not the author of confusion but of peace all right so when it's talking about a thousand years this is just talking about the time period from when Jesus laid down his life and took it up again, ascended to heaven, and with the promise of his return. Alright, and so it started then, and it ends when he returns. 
that's all all right so if you if you wanted to get real technical about this all right you get out your piece of paper and your pencil make sure you got an eraser all right, a big eraser all right so you got a thousand years all right so you notice here it says they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years now you go up here and you also see that Satan is bound for a thousand years all right but okay so once you start doing the math you see after the thousand years Satan is loosed all right when the thousand years are expired Satan shall be loosed out of his prison all right so now you've got a time period of this season as we read up here a little season not a big season but a little season all right now Satan is loose during this little season but you the this uh, thousand years is over also for them that live and reign with Christ a thousand years so after the thousand years it talks about Satan being loosed for a little season what happens to us all right. you got your pencils out you writing all this down you crunching the numbers they don't fit do they no they don't they don't fit at all so how do you explain this well there's only one explanation and I've given it to you a thousand times and that is we are up in the air at the end of the thousand years and Satan is loosed at the end of the thousand years and he's loosed on the earth to deceive the nations and to gather them together all right now if you go back to the Old Testament before Jesus laid down his life there was one nation of God outside of that nation were many nations surrounding the nation of God those nations outside of the nation of God were being deceived by Satan now here comes Jesus and what's he do he binds Satan he bounds him for a thousand years all right he ties him up so he can't go out to deceive the nations why because he has made the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him so now the nation of God is not just one group of people the nation of God is available to whosoever believes in him right and we read this in first Peter chapter 2 where he says and you are a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy uh, you see so before Jesus came along and laid down his life there was one nation of Israel one people of God one people of God which in time past were not the people of God so in the time past there was the people of God which was one country the children of Israel or the nation of Israel whatever you want to call it there was one group of people that was the nation of God 
that was the people of God. Outside of that group of people were nations that were deceived by the devil or Satan or you know the dragon, whatever you want to call him, the old serpent. All right, they were deceived by the devil. Okay. Now, again, when Jesus laid down his life, he, when he, you know, when he, baby Jesus is born, he starts to teach, and he says, the nation of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Just like what we read here in First Peter chapter 2, in time past, we're not a people, but are now the people of God. Now, are we the people of God that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, are we the sons of God? All right. And it's this uh, everlasting life, uh, the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. So now... The old serpent, he's he's bound. He's locked up. He can't go out and deceive the nations like he had done before Jesus came along. Alright, so why is he able, why is he loosed? Well when he's loosed, we are up in the air. You see? So now the only people left on the earth are just like the people that were outside of the nation of Israel before Jesus came along right before when there was this one group of people there was all these nations outside of the people of God that were deceived by Satan because that was not the kingdom of God the kingdom of God was inside the circle which is the people or nation of God outside of that circle were nations that were deceived by Satan now you take away all the people of God you've taken away the nation of God the children of Israel you take them all out of it and all you have left is unsaved people so Satan is loosed and he goes out and deceives them and not just deceives them but he gathers them together to compass the camp of the saints about the beloved city now the beloved city is not on earth but in heaven right so <clears throat> I mean we read that in, in uh, all throughout the Bible really let me just use one example here should be sufficient really in Galatians 4 verse 26 but Jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all Jerusalem which is above our hope is not in the Jerusalem on earth our hope is in the Jerusalem which is above in heaven Oh, this ain't gonna work, is it? No. <laughs> I can do it this way. All right. In the name of my, uh, in the name of the city of my God, is New Jerusalem. All right, which comes down out of heaven from my God. All right, so we see the holy city, the new Jerusalem, is above. The beloved city, that's above, right? Now, um, again, we could go back to when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up in the air. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. 
At the last trump we are changed in the twinkling of an eye. We that are that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are changed from our mortal bodies into our immortal bodies. Alright, so when he comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. It is the harvest. It is when the wheat is separated from the tares. It's the end of the world. And when it's the end of the world, there are no more opportunities for the unsaved to be saved. All right, And when it's the end of the world, everybody's going to know it. All kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. All right, now you don't, you won't get that in the movie Left Behind. All right, so you either got to trust the Bible or you got to trust the movie because they both can't be right. Now, they both could be wrong, but I'm here to tell you the Bible's not wrong, that movie's wrong. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. Alright, so let's go back here. Uh, Revelation, he's, uh, an ounce of salt per day says, Revelation states that Christ returns in the clouds and destroys the kingdoms of the angels and prison Satan, and the people reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's not what Revelation says, not in Revelation 20, not anywhere at all in the Bible. Okay. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is absolutely after the thousand years. You can't you can't refute that. There's this is right here verse 11 and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them this is Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven now one huge mistake people make is thinking Revelation 20 is a continuation of Revelation 19 and it's not all you have to do is go back to Revelation 1 and see the whole purpose of the book of Revelation is to show his servants, the servants of Jesus Christ, the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So John is going to show us these visions that the angel that the angels give him to show us things which must shortly come to pass and I saw you know what the word saw means right he saw a vision he saw an angel and the angel shows John something that must shortly come to pass this is not a continuation because we read this all throughout the book of Revelation, all these visions that are given to John to show us things which must shortly come to pass. So the way I look at this is, this might not work for, for other people, but for me it works, is that this is a picture that's being painted. Here we have a picture that is being painted of the world <clears throat> and you know basically like I, I've already pointed out from the time uh, Jesus laid down his life to the time of his return that's the thousand years that's the period of time that it's talking about so this whole thing is a picture of this moment in time with the ending of it being the judgment of God and of course it, you know just by believing in Jesus you should know that the second death has no power over you right now right you should know that you know just like what we read in John chapter 11 whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die now let's go back to John 11 all right 
Let's go back to John chapter 11. And we see here in verse 25, it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So Jesus, yeah, Jesus is the resurrection. So who's the first resurrection? Yeah, that's right. It is. It's Jesus. See, even my cat knows. If my cat knows, then you ought to know too. Really. All right, so Jesus is the resurrection. We are part, yeah, that's right. We are partakers of his resurrection. Oops, this ain't going to work. We are partakers of his resurrection. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. All right, you get it? You see it? He is the first resurrection, and we are partakers of his resurrection. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The second death has no power over us right now. But ye are a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people, right? Just like what we read in Exodus 19. Right? In Exodus 19, verse 6, I think. But ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Go tell these words to the children of Israel. A kingdom of priests. We are a kingdom of priests. We are a royal priesthood right now. Right, right now we are an holy nation. Right now, right now we are priests of God and of Christ. Right now, and we reign with Him. Right now, He abides in us, and we abide in Him. We are born of the Spirit of God. We are born of God. We are the sons of God. We reign with Christ right now now when the thousand years are expired Satan is loose but we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we are changed into our glorified bodies we go we go from being corruptible to being incorruptible All right, putting on our immortal bodies right so there's no way to get around this now look I get it. it's hard to make a Hollywood movie that fits the scripture so what do you do you just ignore the scripture right and you make your Hollywood movie anyway because it's gonna make money I mean have you ever thought about you know what the appeal is the mystery of the, the the appeal of mystery you see what I'm saying the the appeal of mystery and so you watch the left behind movie and you have a great mystery all of a sudden people disappear and you're like wow it's a great mystery you know mysteries have been all you know been fascinating throughout the course of time right and um, the problem is the Hollywood mystery does not square with reality and in fact you know the Bible has mysteries too in 1st Corinthians 15 behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal have, shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Knowing this mystery, 
you have to conclude that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world and we are changed and death is swallowed up in victory so you cannot have unsaved people living any longer you cannot have a thousand years of bliss I guess and then at the thousand years uh, after you can't have unsaved people living after Jesus returns it doesn't work the only people that are alive when Jesus comes back after after this man I mean when Jesus comes back in the clouds of heaven is it is the judgment of God and if you are not already saved the judgment is death death is swallowed up in victory when he comes in the clouds of heaven we are changed and death is swallowed up in victory so there is no more unsaved people so you can't have a thousand years you got everlasting life you got eternity of people that are transformed into their glorified body there are no unsaved people okay all right so I think that's long enough here but I appreciate that comment I appreciate that question uh, once again I'll say that um, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world there is no thousand years coming after the end of the world after the end of the world it's eternal life everlasting life in our glorified bodies and there is no more pain no more sorrow no more crying no more death all right all those things are going to be done away with when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven all right that's it so there's no purpose no need the only reason people teach us is because they're getting their doctrine from other men namely that movie left behind and they're not getting their doctrine from the Bible because the Bible never mentions this idea of a thousand year reign of Jesus in fact the Bible clearly says he reigns forever and of his kingdom there is no end alright so appreciate it have a good day y'all